Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that will determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views. And for the next hour... They're going to be the views of our good friend, Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Dr. Cuddy has certainly taught at the university level. Uh, He's certainly been with the Department of Education during the Reagan years. He's been a consultant for industry. He's a prolific writer. We have certainly all his current books, and if you haven't read his book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, or The Power Elite, uh, Their History and Their Future, where they are available from Radio Liberty, along with all of the other books that he currently has in print. But right now, now, without further ado, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. All right. Now, uh, as I said, I try to give some sort of contemporary uh, analysis of what's going on. And just touching base uh, primarily on uh, what's happening, uh, I guess the hot item besides the, uh, the Malaysian airplane, is what's going on in the Ukraine. Hold that thought. Hold the thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy was just talking about uh, uh, what's going on in the Ukraine. What is really going on over there? Are we really getting the truth? Are the Russians really massing troops to invade the Ukraine? I don't believe so at all. In fact, basically, this whole thing is so contrived. Basically, you have to understand the Ukraine was pro-communist. The fellow who was in charge there, Yukanovich, was pro-Soviet. And so we spent $5 billion in the United States certainly on, uh, on efforts to overthrow him. And they've got the d- demonstrators out in the streets throwing stones and Molotov cocktails at the police. But, ladies and gentlemen, you can't overthrow an organized government uh, with Molotov cocktails and certainly with stones. Uh, but somebody uh, gave the order that the police and the military, the Ukrainian police and military, were to be pulled back. And, of course, they were. And then, of course, the radicals who we were financing took over. And what did they do? Well, of course, they basically, and then, of course, we justify taking the Crimea over. But, of course, then, of course, they put in this radical extremist movement in the West. This is the group that we brought to power. Now they're going to have, certainly, an election over there. It almost looks like, certainly, a pro-communist individual is going to win that election. But this is all totally contrived. And there's another purpose behind it. We're not being told the truth. But they certainly everything is being done to focus our attention on this region for a purpose. And I'm not certain what it's about. Go ahead, Dr. Cuddy. What are your thoughts? Well, um, it fits. I mean, it fits with the overall plan, the dialectical process of, you know, in, in terms of World War II language, Nazis versus uh, Soviet communists. Uh, and, and I say Soviet because the Soviet Union never really collapsed. <laughs> that was all a farce. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's the, the usual uh, suspects involved because the opposition uh, to the pro-Soviet, the pro-communist outfit uh, is the old uh, nationalist, U- Ukrainian nationalist movement. And if you look at, uh, just get on the Internet and look at the, the leader, the founder. He's been dead many years ago. But there's a stamp to him and statue. And it's uh, Stefan, as we would say, or Stepan, as they say, S-T-E-P-A-N, uh, Bandera. Uh, I believe it's B A N D E R uh, R A, and you'll see him in his little his uh, little SS uh, Nazi uniform, <laughs> you know, so, and he he sort of loved the Nazis. Of course, the Nazis paid you know repaid him for his kindness by you know jailing him or whatever. But th- that didn't matter because later on, when the Soviets got in control after World War uh, II, uh, they I believe they assassinated the guy in 1958. But anyway, the the point is, it's the usual Nazi versus. Uh, communist thing that's going on, but as Dr. Stan says, it, it has a larger, a larger uh, motive. And uh, if if you look, say earlier this month, there was a publication March third of uh, of this year, 
and it's by uh, in the publication. It's a conservative publication, a weekly called Human Events. In fact, years ago, I used to write. I used to write almost regularly. There's something like once a week uh, for Human Events. It's uh, in Washington. It's a small outfit, but it has a, a really strong following. And in there, uh, they titled the article back then: "Putin plays chess while Obama plays marbles." And it's interesting that they would say Putin plays chess because, remember, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who's sort of lurking behind the scenes all the time, uh, he is picked up by David Rockefeller after his book, uh, Brzezinski's book, Between Two Ages, which was published in 1970 and 1973. Uh, Rockefeller uh, makes him the uh, director of the Trilateral Commission when it's formed. And then he has him, you know, he tells Jimmy Carter what to do like bring the Shah into uh, this country so that they would take over our embassy, which they had warned us about in advance. So anyway, uh, Brzezinski uh, becomes the uh, uh, national security advisor for Jimmy Carter and gets, lures the Soviets into Afghanistan. He denies it first, but 20 years or so later he says, yep, that's it. So anyway... Uh, basically, Brz- basically uh, all this was contrived. Right. Brzezinski, uh, uh, 20 years later, admitted they intentionally lured the Soviets into attacking Afghanistan. They wanted that war, but they want all these wars. Who do you think financed the Nazis before World War II and during World War II? We did. Who's financed communism since its inception? We are who build the oil well, to drill the oil wells and the natural gas wells in 1991 and 1992 for the, uh, the Russians, you know, so they would have an income for their nation so they could maintain their dicta- dictatorship. Because remember, they keep talking about all the oligarchs over there in Russia. They're, they're just all KGB. Why, we, we finance the drilling of the oil wells out of the gas wells in Russia. But it's all about creating the best enemy money could buy. And if you don't have an enemy, how can you rally the American people behind the government to protect us from a phony enemy that you've created? And just as we are financing the terrorist movement throughout the world and actually killing Americans, and then we point to those terrible terrorists and say, oh, look at them. We need more power over the over the American people. We've got to listen to everybody's telephone calls and monitor their emails and their faxes to protect them from those wicked terrorists that we're financing. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, what's, what's interesting is uh, uh, regarding this, uh, the, the, the gurus, you know, foreign, but there's, the, the CFR has Foreign Affairs is their main publication, but there's another similar one called Foreign Policy. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you remember, maybe you don't, but if you do remember, uh, back during the 2008 presidential uh, campaign, when, uh, you know, with grinning Joe Biden, or as I call him, gaffing Joe, uh, was up against uh, Sarah Palin. Uh, you'll recall that uh, she made a statement in, in foreign policy and all these geniuses that were ridiculing her. And her, her statement back then actually was very, very prescient. She said, quote, After the Russian army invaded the nation of Georgia, Senator Obama's reaction was one of indecision and moral equivalent, the kind of response that would only encourage Russia's Putin to invade Ukraine next, end quote. And that's, you know, that's years ago when they were first running in 2008. And everybody sort of chuckled at it when she said that. But, of course, as Dr. Stan says, the whole thing is planned anyway. Because what you have here is the fulfillment of the secret Nazi plan, which is a subpart of the larger power of these plans. And it's at this nexus, you know, because the, the Crimea is an area where it's been fought over for, you know, ages and ages. Uh, was, you know, first is the Ottoman Turks, and then Germany, and then Russia, and everybody's sort of slicing their way in there because it's it's really the gateway to the Black uh, from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, and which is another reason that, you know, uh, Slobodan Milosevic had to go because he was sort of blocking Germany's way down there. It's all, all part of this, this, uh, this plan. And what you have to remember is there's a a very large number of Muslims in that area. So remember, the Nazis had allied with the Muslims uh, beginning in the 1930s, and then all this Arab Spring of about three years ago is is all part of that. And what uh, what you find is that uh, these people sort of use code words. It's like Sir Francis Bacon back in the 1600s would use codes. Well, they use codes, uh, the parallel, uh, all all down through history. And so uh, you you 
you refer generally to Russia as the Russian bear. You know, that's the symbol, the great Russian bear. And, uh, and so what you find is that if you look at the Bible, and you look at Daniel uh, chapter 7, verse 5, it's talking about the bear kingdom. The bear kingdom. And it says that in the last days, uh, this bear kingdom is going to rise up and, quote, devour much flesh. See? So you got the bear kingdom. And then <clears throat> if you go about 100 years or so ago with Cecil Rose and the secret society, as he said, to take the government uh, of the whole world, is what he said, uh, what you find is that people involved with him in this effort, like uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, I've mentioned, and I put copies of the cover in my book, Secret Records Reveal, of <clears throat> Rudyard Kipling's books from the 1890s. They have swastikas on it, which is way, way before Hitler. But in 1898, remember what Kipling wrote. He said, quote, this is 1898, way before Hitler, Kipling who has swastikas on his books. Quote, when he shows at seeking quarter with paws, that's P-A-W-S, paws like hands in prayer, that is the time of peril, P-E-R-I-L, the time of the capital T, truce, of the capital B, bear, In quote. Get it? Truce? That we've had, like Cold War, then it stopped. No Gorby, Gorby, everything hunky dory, perestroika, glass nose, but not. And the capital B, bear, Russian bear. See? Okay, so anyway, these people all, all use these codes and symbolisms, and, and so, like Dr. Stan said, it's, it's all cash and planned and over and over again. And what Putin's doing is very, very similar to what uh, Hitler did, you know, in the beginning of World War II. When he used uh, the excuse uh, to, to invade the Sudetenland. As a result, uh, you know, he said they're German-speaking peoples uh, along uh, the Czechoslovakian border, and they're complaining that they're being treated uh, badly, and so we got to go in there and protect them, right? And so that's what Putin's doing. So there's these Russians there in the eastern part of Ukraine, and, you know, they're getting the, the bad treatment, and so we got to go in there and protect them, and, and so on. And so, yeah, and the, and the opposite, of course, is the, the strong right-wing nationalist movement in western uh, Ukraine, which has its, it traces its roots back to the Nazis. And like I said, you can go on to uh, Stefan or Stepan uh, Bandera's uh, the website, just Google that name of there, and you'll see a bunch of pictures. You know, you'll see the, a rally by that uh, the Ukrainian nationalist, organ, whatever the thing's called, and they'll have a big old swastika flag there <laughs> waving it around. And so, you know, it's the usual suspects. They're repeating the same sort of strategy over and over again. And what it is, is they're just following the Paralyse plan, and, uh, you know, Brzezinski says that. Uh, like the article in Human Events, Putin plays chess while Obama plays marbles. And that's why his Brzezinski's book in 1997 was called The Grand Chessboard, The Grand Chessboard. Because he sees everything as this geopolitical chessboard. And he said, you know, we're going to do certain things over that area. The Muslims will react negatively. There may be even terrorist attacks, but we can manipulate events, blah, blah, blah. And then when uh, Russia invaded Georgia... You would think you'd say, that's bad, the U.S. position should win. No, no, Brzezinski said, well, we want equivalence there. We want a balance. And so that's, what he's, you know, that's what's going on now. That's what's going on now in, in the Ukraine. It's all part of the plan, and we'll pick up after the break. And ladies and gentlemen, you must understand, if you don't have an enemy, how are you going to rally the people behind the government? How are you going to get them to give up their freedom in the name of protecting us from those wicked Nazis or communists or terrorists? Right. It's the same thing. It's like days of old all over again. Well, Dennis, you go right ahead. Okay, well, uh, that, that's, anyway, that's what's going on. It's uh, the furtherance of the plan, the secret Nazi plan, which is a sub-part of the power elite plan. And that's why you have the, the resurrection of the battle between the East and uh, the pro-Russian uh, uh, forces, communist, and the old uh, ally, the ally of the Nazis in the West, and, and so forth and so on, with a strong contingent of Muslims because they had allied with the, uh, you know, with the uh, Nazi Party, beginning in the 19, uh, 1930s. And so now, picking back, uh, picking up with the book where we left off last time, my book, The Paralyte, Their History and Future. The next chapter that we get into do is one called a quote, bold new world quote, and Quote, forces too, T-O-O, powerful, end quote. 
And the force is too powerful aspect of the chapter will pick up uh, toward the very end because there's a, a rather foreboding uh, quote uh, that I'll give you from a former CIA director when uh, somebody was sort of challenging and poking their nose where they shouldn't have been. He said, he warned him. He warned him. He said, listen, there are forces too powerful. This is the head of the CIA. There are forces too powerful for us to confront at this time, you know, maybe later. So anyway, uh, I begin this uh, this chapter of the book uh, with the bold new world as part of the title because uh, that was the uh, title uh, by a book called, uh, uh, the name of the person, the author was William, uh, I guess you pronounce it Doki, K-N-O-K-E. And uh, he was the founder and president of what was called the Harvard Capital Group. And that was the sort of advisory group to global corporations, uh, which I'm somewhat familiar with because I did a little of that myself back some years ago with uh, another uh, outfit that uh, had offices in Tokyo and Frankfurt and Paris and London and New York. And what they wanted to do was uh, they had country experts, and that's what I was. I was uh, a sort of country expert uh, primarily regarding uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the U.S. And they wanted to know who was rising to power and who was falling from power, short-term 18 months, long-term five years. And uh, they had uh, transnational corporations, governments, and intelligence agencies as their uh, their clients. And so this uh, this fellow was with a similar group, William Doki, and in his book his book was titled Bold New World, with a subtitle The Essential Roadmap to the 21st Century. 21st Century, and they he titled that because it was published in 1996. Now what he did there, you know, similar to what I do, I try to project what's going to happen. And Doki uh, projected that quote in the 21st century. We will each retain, talk about our nations, our indigenous cultures, our unique blend of tribal affiliations. Yet, he says, our passion for the large nation state for which our ancestors fought with their blood will dwindle to the same emotional consequences of county or province today. A new spirit of global citizenship will evolve in its place and with it, the ascendancy of global governance, end quote. So he's one of these insiders who's just, you know, talking about what's going to come. Uh, the nation state will sort of dwindle away, and it'll be, we'll look at them like counties or provinces, because we'll all be these world citizens, and the world will have a global governance or world government, and that's what will uh, really uh, matter. Now, uh, I, I want to stress that his this vision, this quote that I used, is not a new one. Uh, because uh, my old pen pal, as I call him, Arnold Toynbee, who was probably the leading historian of the first part of the 20th century. Hold that thought, Dennis. Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and you must understand that there is a small group of people whose loyalty is not to America. They're a subversive group. Uh, they want to create a world government, a world uh, a financial system. They want to, of course, and they want to control a, a, a one world government, a one world financial system, a one world religion. They want to destroy Christianity. These are people of great wealth, and this is their main goal and purpose in life, and this has been going on at least for a hundred years. Years. And basically, these are the people who control both political parties, control the banking system, control our military, control most of our major corporations, control the media, control our churches, control our great tax exam foundations, control the intelligence agencies. They have, they have their leaders in the leadership of both political parties. And basically, of course, they're energized by this uh, demand that we are going to change the world. They're going to use the financial and military power of the United States to bring about this world government, which is why we have our troops stationed all throughout the world. This is why, certainly, we're concerned about what's going on in Ukraine, why we've overthrown the government, certainly, in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in Libya and in Tunisia and certainly in Egypt, and we're trying to overthrow the government. And certainly, in Syria today, we've killed 140,000 civilians over there, the people that nobody would be dead if we weren't financing the rebels, uh, and it's all done with your tax money, and the American people really don't care, but what everybody's missing is the fact that God does care, and I fear he's going to bring terrible judgment on America, because the good people here 
are doing absolutely nothing other than enjoying life and thing is going to go on forever in one way or another and i believe god is going to bring its judgment on america and i tremble for my country when i reflect that god is just and his justice will not sleep forever go right ahead Dennis. sounds like jefferson <laughs> that's a good quote the uh Toynbee, uh, Arnold Toynbee, uh, was probably the uh, leading world historian in the first part of the 20th century. And I was a young fellow in high school. Uh, one of my assignments was to become him, uh, know all about him and so forth. And so after I did this really, you know, thorough report and uh, write-up, and uh, it was very, you know, very much in-depth. Uh, I sent a copy uh, over to him at Chatham House, and he wrote back a nice letter, you uh, young fellow could have done better myself that sort of stuff so anyway uh, what I found out I didn't know at the time but uh, later uh, when uh, Dr. Stan uh, had sent me the list of the secret society membership list uh, Toynbee was one of the members of the association of helpers there's a circle of initiates and then there's an association of helpers as part of this effort on the uh, Cecil Rose's effort to take uh, the as he said the government of the whole world and so I was looking back, and in uh, June 1931, Toynbee had delivered a paper which sounds very much similar to what William Doak uh, just said in this 1996. And in that 1931 paper, uh, Toynbee, who was part of Cecil Rhodes' efforts, said a local state may lose its sovereignty without losing those familiar features which endear it to the local patriot. Such features, I mean, as the local vernacular language and folklore and costume and the local monuments of the historical past. But if we are frank with ourselves, we shall admit that we are engaged on a deliberate and sustained and concentrated effort to impose limitations upon the sovereignty and the independence of the sovereign independent state. And basically, Chris, this is a subversive movement. The people who control our government are subversive. Why? They want to subvert our, our form of government. Uh, we are changing from being a republic into a democracy, and a democracy is nothing more than rule by a ruling elite that control both political parties, and they bribe the politicians to vote for whatever they want, and basically it's always centralizing ever more power in the government, and now they're watching everything you do, uh, they're reading your emails, they're reading your faxes, but does anybody really care as long as things are good and, and we have football and basketball and baseball and all sorts of entertainment and wonderful television, free television entertainment, night after night after night. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and also under Obamacare, uh, before, if you were to log on, you know, trying to get your insurance, which you're required to have, uh, if you were to log on and say, well, I think I want to look at the various plans, you can't do that until you give them a ton of information. You have to log in. And, man, I mean, they don't just want to know your you know, the name and address. They want to know all kinds of information before you can even look at the plans that you might consider. So they're building these dossiers on all of us and getting tons and tons and tons of information uh, to boot. And so, uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a massive uh, co- collection of uh, personal private information that uh, you don't you know I mean you don't give it to anybody else I mean you walk into a store and you know you want to get to get an object or use a credit card or before you I'm sorry we're not going to let you look at those toys until you give us you know your religious affiliation and everything else about you personally okay hold that thought we'll be back in a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy well Dennis you go right ahead Okay, well, uh, picking up with uh, what Toynbee said in June of 1931, his quote continues, the dragon, the you always know, got to make it sound nasty and bad, the dragon of local sovereignty can still use its teeth and claws when it is brought to bay. Nevertheless, I believe that the uh, monster is doomed to perish by our sword. He's going to slay national sovereignty. It continues, the 50 or 60 local states of the world will no doubt survive as administrative conveniences, but sooner or later, sovereignty will depart from them, end quote. So that's uh, that's what their attitude was. That's uh, 40 years after the founding by Cecil Rhodes of his secret society. So all of those Rhodes 
scholars who say, well, yes, Cecil Rhodes might have had some dream like that, but then he forgot about that and just said, we'll have some Rhodes scholars and everything will be hunky-dory. Dennis, no, no. Dennis, where can we get that quotation you just gave? That is such an important quotation. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, let me just continue, okay. and my continuance will show you where you get it. Uh, in this chapter of The Bold New World, uh, what I say next after quoting Toynbee was that uh, he was one of those individuals pursuing uh, Rhodes, this, uh, as he said, quote, scheme to take the government of the whole world. Now, his, his paper that I just quoted from, that was reprinted in the November 1931 edition of International Affairs. That's the name of the journal. And that's the journal of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Uh, remember, that's the counterpart, the British counterpart to the CFR. There's the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and in this country, the CFR. And the RIIA, Royal Institute of International Affairs, was an outgrowth uh, specifically of the semi-secret roundtable groups uh, that was formed. Now, those were formed primarily between 1908 and 1913 uh, with the objective to further Rhodes' plan for this uh, elite, as I call them, to uh, dominate the world. And uh, according to Bill Clinton's mentor, uh, with you know, you know, Carol Quigley at Georgetown University, in his book *Tragedy and Hope*, which was published 1966, uh, the elite who formed these uh, roundtable groups, as Quigley says, "quote In 1919, founded the Royal Institute of International Affairs." He goes on. Similar institutes of international affairs were established in the chief British dominions and in the United States. Uh, where it is known as the Council on Foreign Relations, in quote. So that's what Quigley said. So Quigley is, is saying this, and then you can get that specific uh, journal uh, article, I mean the, the paper, which was reprinted in the November 1931 edition of International Affairs. Now, you can't get that at the local library, but if you go to any good college library, university library, uh, they'll, they'll have that. Okay, well, this is Dr. Stan, I guess this is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and he's simply talking about the fact that Arnold Toynbee, writing in the 1930s in International Affairs, now International Affairs is the theoretical publication of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which is the English counterpart of the Council on Foreign Relations, and these two subversive organizations are English, suddenly control, respectively, the British government and the American government, and almost all of the key positions in our government are held by people, either uh, oh, members of the Council on Foreign Relations or related to it very, very closely. And, uh, but this is how the government is run now, basically, since 1973. Why the Trilateral Commission is dominated our government, in fact, it's not by coincidence, that between 1977 and the year 2009, every president of the United States and or vice president of the United States came from the membership roles of the Trilateral Commission. And when Barack Hussein Obama suddenly became president, he appointed 11 of the 87 or 85 members of the Trilateral Commission, North American chapter of the Trilateral Commission, to be his key advisors. And certainly, uh, certainly uh, many of those people are still in key positions today, and they control the Obama administration. He is simply a figurehead. But, of course, you're never going to read that in a controlled medium, because they control control our reality. Dennis, you go right ahead. Yeah, and uh, and remember about Brzezinski, just as a note to what I was saying earlier, remember in his book, Between Two Ages, he praised Marxism. He said Marxism is wonderful. So just remember that as you as you look at his machinations uh, under Jimmy Carter and under Obama and his grand chessboard scheme and what's happening in the Ukraine. Okay, now, uh, the, uh, the Toynbee uh, the publication is November 1931 edition of International Affairs. That's the name of the journal. Now, he actually was delivering the speech, though. It was a speech, a paper he was presenting in Copenhagen. And uh, the paper uh, was actually read to the what was called the Fourth Annual Conference of Institutions for the Scientific Study of International Relations. You know, it's a big, long title. And uh, there, were, there were 12 countries uh, were represented there when he gave the speech in Copenhagen, uh, along with the delegates delegates from uh, four international organizations, and, uh, the, uh, and the conferences were initiated by the League of Nations. Uh, it's, uh, it's group, uh, they had various groups. This was the League of Nations uh, Institute for Intellectual Cooperation. That's what it was called. So that's what he was delivering his speech in his paper uh, before them, that body, in 1931. And uh, 
national uh, coming out of that, of course, national coordinating committees were also formed uh, with uh, one of their purposes uh, being the execution of resolutions passed by the conferences. And in the Toynbee paper that I quoted from, he, he stated uh, the following. Now, note specifically the word we, W-E, we, in this quote. Now, this is Toynbee in this same paper. Note where he uses the word we. He says, I will merely, this is Toynbee, I will merely repeat that we are at present working discreetly, but with all our might to rest, that's W-R-E-S-T, rest this mysterious political force called sovereignty out of the clutches of the local nation states of the world. And all the time we are denying with our lips what we are doing with our hands because to impugn the sovereignty of the uh, local nation states of the world is still a heresy for which a statesman or a publicist can be perhaps not quite burnt at the stake, but certainly can be ostracized and discredited, in quote. But you see, the thing is that the average individual has no idea that the people who control both of our political parties are subversives. Uh, they do not believe in the United States. They are using the financial and military power of the United States to bring about a world government. That is why we have over a thousand foreign military bases. Uh, suddenly we have our troops stationed at least 130 nations. I mean, why do we have massive numbers, 40, 50,000 troops permanently stationed in Germany and, uh, and 30 or 40,000 troops permanently stationed in Japan and 20 or 30,000 troops permanently stationed in South Korea? troops stationed all over the world because we control the world, ladies and gentlemen. We control those governments. The people there think they elect their representatives. They don't any more than we elect our representatives. We go to the polls every four years to vote for the candidate of their choice, not our choice. Why suddenly uh, in 2008 did we have John McCain, the most liberal Republican senator in the U.S. Senate, running against Barack Obama, the most liberal Democrat senator, uh, uh, you know, the United States Senate, because both of them are controlled by the same people. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay. Now, uh, somebody might say, okay, so there's this guy, Toynbee, and he makes a speech in 1931, and okay, but that's isolated. You, you can't really say there's this massive movement just because of that. Well, remember, Cecil Rhodes had this plan that uh, it would be a conspiracy for six decades. He figured by the end of that time, he would have about 3,000 at least of his people spread around the world, and then they could select others. But uh, just to give an example of how this Toynbee quote from 1931 isn't the only thing, uh, there was a, uh, a, uh, a book uh, at that time, same year, 1931, and it was titled International Understanding, Agencies Educating for a New World. And the book was by uh, John Eugene Harley. Well, uh, there's a fellow who wrote the foreword to that book called pa Paul Bantu, M-A-N-T-O-U-X. He wrote the foreword uh, to that book. And in that foreword, he says, quote, How can a well-prepared elite, they use that word, elite, be raised throughout the world to spread its influence over the masses who can then support them in their turn, question mark? Then he answers himself, plainly, the first step is the step in the case of each country is to train an elite to think, feel, and act internationally. Period. In quote. So remember, you know, world citizen Barack Obama, that type of life. yeah, world citizen. See, you got to train to think, feel, and act internationally. In quote. Now, in order to do that in the U.S., uh, though, our uh, our Constitution, which is a nationalist uh, document. Uh, would first have to be uh, undermined, right? You've got to undermine it. You've got to get rid of that concept of that old traditional constitution. And in that regard, if you look the next year, 1932, uh, there was a fellow named William K. Wallace, and he wrote a book that was titled Our Obsolete Constitution. See, how convenient. You know, the very next year, this book, Our Obsolete Constitution, is published. And Wallace had, uh, he, he's not, I mean, you probably never heard of it, but anyway, Wallace uh, had accompanied President Wilson to Paris. After World War One, and uh, was attached to the uh, the American Commission to negotiate the peace. So this is no, you know, just ivory tower guy who's just got an idea. He's uh, right up there with President Wilson. And in that book uh, that uh, Wallace wrote, our obsolete Constitution. Now remember, this is a guy traveling with Woodrow Wilson. 
he wrote in his book, uh, Wallace did, the age of, end quote, the age of individualism is past. The Constitution is no longer adequate to meet the requirements of our age. This is 1932, he's writing this. The individual must adopt the one best way or plan which has been scientifically determined by experts. The absurdity of such doctrines as those of national rights and a social contract has long been recognized. As we have gone beyond the stage of believing in an oh, avenging God, see, we've gone beyond that, the God, that, that type of God, he's old-fashioned. As we have gone beyond the stage of believing in an avenging God, so we are coming to realize that ideas of political sovereignty are, be, uh, are borrowing from ignorant notions about the source of power in the state. Sovereignty in its narrow territorial aspects must be abandoned. We must be prepared to integrate scientific capitalism with the principle of scientific socialism. It is admitted on all sides that national directive control of industry must be undertaken. In the immediate future, the state will control the means of production, in quote. So here's, here you have this nice guy, a guy traveling around with, uh, with President Wilson, and we're going to have uh, a joining of capitalism and socialism and sovereignty, national sovereignty is uh, old-fashioned, you know, just like uh, the Vinci God, he's old-fashioned. And so we have to move forward to this wonderful scientific... Now, remember, this is 1932. Uh, FDR is going to basically run on this, this type of uh, platform, and he will develop, uh, when he gets into the office of president, he'll develop national planning boards and so forth and so on. And it goes basically what we're really seeing. Uh, this is why, why the United States, at least the elite who run the United States, funded national socialism in Germany. Yep. This is why they funded communism in Russia. It's all in this together. We're going to suddenly have these enemies over there as we centralize more and more power in Washington, D.C. And the people go along with it because they think we have enemies overseas. And they give up step by step their individual freedom as we move towards an authoritarian structure uh, under a ruling elite in the United States, and that's just exactly what we have today. And you go to the polls, polls every four years, you vote for the candidate of their choice, and they put in electronic voting machines across America so they can rig the elections. Have you checked to see how your uh, votes are actually counted? Have you checked to see if they've actually counted fairly? Do you honestly believe that the, there is one electronic voting machine out there that can't be rigged if they want to? Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and in the, the same year, 1932, a Rhodes Scholar, there's always a Rhodes Scholar, you know, lurking around somewhere. Uh, Rhodes Scholar Clyde Eagleton's uh, book, which is called International Government, uh, that was published. And in the preface of a, I guess it's like the second edition, 1948 edition, the revised, he stated, quote, I am concerned with the slowly evolving constitutional law and organization of the community of nations developing toward international or world government, end quote. And uh, then in the text uh, of the book, he noted that, quote, the following arguments have been offered in favor of regionalism. Number one, development should be attempted gradually rather than in one jump toward world government. Such a world system could be better built upon the solid foundation of regional systems. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's what Brzezinski would say at the uh, 1995 first Gorbachev uh, State of the World Forum. You know, we won't get the world government through one quick leap. leap. We'll have to have regionalism first. So he's just he's simply picking up on this plan. Now, concerning uh, the pursuit of world government via uh, regionalism, uh, Graham Howard, uh, in his book called America and a New World Order, it's 1940, you know, the very year that the American edition of H.G. Uh, Wells' book, New World Order, came out, is Graham Howard, his book, in America and, and a New World Order. Howard argued uh, regarding, quote, the framework for support of the New World Order, that promising both a more ethical and a more realistic solution is the formation of regional economic entities. Cooperative regionalism 
will bring about a better world order through internationally balanced economic and political regional bloc. Like like having a North American Union, a yeah. European Union, an African Union, an Asian Union. They're all coming to pass today. This is long-term planning, ladies and gentlemen. But you're never going to get this from Rush Limbaugh. Go right ahead. Uh, no, and, and remember within that quote it says to internationally balanced economic and political regional bloc. Remember, balanced. Now, if this is going to be balanced, you have to have what? A redistribution of jobs, of wealth. The U.S. cannot be primary, right? you got to have us down and other nations up. I mean, that's what it has to be if it's internationally balanced economic and political regional blocks. So that's what all of this is doing. It's, it's readjusting everything. So we will have, you know, diminished uh, jobs, uh, increasing debt. A lot of jobs will go overseas. Uh, the the Congress passes laws saying if you bring your profits back here, they're going to be taxed, but they won't be taxed if you keep them over there. That's to build them up, and we go down, and there. that's the way you will get this balance, this balanced uh, economic uh, planning that he's, uh, that he's talking about. And basically what they're talking about is building up the economy of other yep. nations and lowering the economy here. Why do you think that the China has made such great strides? And the living standards of the Chinese people, I mean, uh, 20 years ago, they were primarily an agrarian society, an impoverished agrarian society. They're the second most powerful nation in the world today economically. And it's because we have built up the economy of China, raised their living standards as the living standards in America slowly go down, and the average American certainly doesn't understand this is not happening by accident. It's happening by intent. But, of course, since the media is controlled, nobody is going to tell the American people. Go right ahead. Okay, that uh, quote by Graham Howard in his book, America's New World Order, was 1940. And then the very next year, there's an article uh, in the July 1941 issue of a periodical called The Annals of American Academy of Political and Social Science. And that article is by an M.J. Bond, B-O-N-N. And in that article, he writes that, quote, national planning means deliberately deliberate international anarchy, but we are not yet going to have a world state. The formation of regional federations by hitherto autonomous groups of countries is much easier. With every move, a step towards a new world order is taken, end quote. And then the next year after that, 1942, you have a book called Post-War World. Now, remember, this is 42. The war is, you know, going hot and furious. It's not going to end for three more years. But he's writing in Post-War World, a fellow named P.E. Corbett. His first name is Percy. And he was uh, also a member of uh, the group that's furthering uh, Rose's plan. You know, the Association of Helpers, he was a member of that group. And the list Dr. Stan sent me, it's not just, you know, the the people in England. There are New Zealand, Australian, Canadian, and so forth, and German, and German uh, members of this Association of Helpers. And so P.E. Corbett is one of these guys. And in that uh, book, Post-War Worlds, he wrote, quote, a world association binding together and coordinating regional groupings of states may evolve toward one universal federal government, as in the past, loose confederations have grown into federal unions. World government is the ultimate aim, but there is more chance of attaining it by gradual development, end quote. And so that's uh, P.E. Corbett, who's a member of Cecil Rhodes' Association of Helpers. And then that same year, 1942, uh, you have to have, you know, religion or religious leaders is all part of this. Can't leave anybody else. In 1942, the Federal Council of Churches, later be, you know, World Council, but now we call it the, the, I mean, the National Council, which is part of the World Council, at that time, at that time, they weren't called national, they were called federal. Federal councils of churches uh, convened a, was called a commission to study the basis of a just and durable peace. It's 1942, three, three years to go before the war ends. And uh, that was in June of, uh, let's see, oh yeah, in June of 1996, uh, Bishop William Swing, he may be more familiar name to you people, uh, was saying something very similar to this. He convened an interfaith forum called United Religions. And that was a prelude to Mikhail Gorbachev's second uh, State of the World Forum in October of 1996. But anyway, back at that commission in 1942, what they did is uh, they published a series of lectures, and it was titled A Basis for uh, the Peace to Come. 
And in uh, John Foster Dulles' lecture, see, he was there uh, at, at that time. Alan Dulles was OSS CIA, but his brother, John Foster Dulles, was at that series of lectures. His uh, title was Toward World Order. Hold that, that thought, was, hold that thought, Dennis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is long-term planning by a small, subversive group. People of great wealth whose dedicated, is, is dedication is to this world government, but they're motivated by evil. And when you understand that, it begins to make sense. Dennis, you go right ahead. Okay, so uh, John Foster Dulles is delivering a lecture at this uh, forum regarding, you know, the, the Federal Council of Churches. He's, he's speaking there, and his speech is titled Toward World Order. Now, now remember, when you listen to this, this is the fellow, John Foster Dulles, who President Eisenhower in the 50s would choose to be his Secretary of State. Now, remember that. He's going to be chosen about 10 years after this speech, to be the Secretary of State by President Eisenhower, supposedly, supposedly a conservative, a Republican. And this is what Dulles said 10 years before Eisenhower was picking him. In 1942, 10 years before Eisenhower, this is what Dulles said. So it's well known what his view is. Quote, we have found that regional integration is not alone adequate. We must find a system of government which can exercise jurisdiction which is worldwide. Let us first consider the solution of world government. It involves an organization dedicated to the general welfare, the peace and order of mankind, and the assuming of an allegiance to this goal superior to that of any national allegiance. By these initial steps, we will have begun that dilution of sovereignty, which all enlightened thinkers agree to be indispensable, end quote. Now, what business has this kind of guy with this kind of attitude got being Secretary of State under uh, an American president, any American president? But you'll see it repeated. You'll see it repeated with Bill Clinton and uh, making number two at the State Department, Strobe Talbot, who was his Rhodes Scholar roommate. And even after, even after Strobe Talbot in uh, July 20th issue of Time Magazine, 1992, I believe that was State. He wrote an article uh, in which he said, uh, perhaps national sovereignty is not such a great idea after all in the case of world government's clinch. That's what Stroh Talbot said in 1992. And then Bill Clinton has him become his number two at the State Department, and he's confirmed by, I think it was 96 senators. 96 senators confirmed as number two at the State Department, Stroh Talbot, after he made a statement like that, perhaps national sovereignty is not such a great idea after all in the case of world government's clinch. What business has that kind of guy got being Secretary of State or number two in any powerful position in the State Department? So they're just repeating what Eisenhower did with Dulles after Dulles made his views well known uh, regarding uh, national sovereignty. Uh, now, in the same year, in September 1942, there was a publication called Free World, and it had Round Table Number 10. Remember the Round Table groups? Round Table Number 10, and it was titled the coming world order. And in addition... I'm going to have to interrupt you there, Dennis. We're just about out of time. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and suddenly Dennis is talking about all the key people in government, whether it be John Foster Dulles, whether it be Strobe Talbot, but these are all subversives, uh, working at the highest level of our government and utilizing the American government to bring about uh, suddenly the overthrow of the existing sovereign governments throughout the world and mold them all into this one world government. This is the way we're going, and I believe God is going to bring his judgment on America because of what we've done. We've fomented wars. There have been slaughters all across the world, and a terrible, terrible war is coming. It's not a matter of if, but when, because God is going to bring his judgment uh, suddenly on this country and about the rest of the world because the world has turned against God, and this has happened many times in the past and I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just his justice will not sleep forever Dr. Cuddy thank you very much we'll look forward to having you with us again next week and we'll continue this discussion hey, thanks for having me God bless well this is Dr. Stan here and I hope you enjoy the interview with Dr. Dennis Cuddy every week because he's certainly one of the fundamental thinkers on this and the quotations you've heard today are vitally important the subversive element controls 
both political parties. They said, this small little clique of people, they're not very many of them, a few thousand, but they're dedicated to using the financial and military power of the United States to bring about a world government, which is why we spend so much on our military, why we have the largest military in the world, why certainly our military is stationed all throughout the world, crushing dissent, and we actually we hire professional killers, and they work not only in other countries, they work here. We have a four CD set called Deadly Assassins. Deadly Assassins are where I actually interview professional CIA murderers trained by the CIA in the United States to murder people in the United States. The four CD set, Deadly Assassins, is available by calling one 800 Five four four eight nine two seven. We're not talking about imaginary things. We're talking about real things. You need to read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. You need to certainly get the, the material we have on the world occult movement. I said we have certainly a four CD set called The Aquarian Conspiracy, interviews with Constance Cumby. We have the four CD set with William H. Kennedy called uh, The Supernatural. Of course, William died at a very young age, as so often happens to people who bring out the truth about what's going on. William died, a personal friend, uh, at 59, uh, after putting up one of the finest websites, going into the occult uh, uh, background of what is really going on today. Today. But of course, you can listen to my interviews with William in the 4 CD set, The Supernatural, and we have so many other things. Adolf Hitler didn't die in a monk, a bunker. He actually escaped to South America with the full help of people at the highest levels of our government, along with tens of thousands of Nazi war criminals responsible for the Holocaust, because people in America were financing the Nazis when they were slaughtering the Jews. And basically, yes, that is the 4 CD set that Hitler or escape. It's available from Radio Liberty. If you want the book, certainly the one we have in stock right now is Grey Wolf. And that's Grey Wolf, but the four CD set did Hitler escape, and he did escape. And along with the, the Nazis, we have another four CD set called Operation Paperclip. Going to the background of how Adolf Hitler uh, pardon me, going into how suddenly the Nazi war criminals were helped to escape to South America in the rat line, R-A-T line, rat line. A lot of this is available on the Internet. You can check it out. Now, there's a lot of confusing things on the Internet, but fortunately you can check things out you could never check out before. We need your help financially to maintain our network of stations across America, indeed, across the world. Our telephone number, one 800 544 1-800-544-8927 our webpage radioliberty.com where you can listen to our radio programs certainly five hours or four hours a day where you can watch our DVDs where you can read our newsletters and then we ask you to pray for America we ask you to pray for revival for our leaders and our ministers but please pray for my ministry Radio Liberty our number one 800 844 8927. 